we love you so very much. We're so grateful for the way that you have loved us. You have loved us far more than we deserve and you love us unendingly. And God, we pray that you would be near to us this morning as we open your word, that you would speak to us, that this wouldn't just be a time of learning about you, but God, you'd be in this place with us. That as we look through your word, through your scriptures, God, that we would find you here with us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. I'm sure a lot of y'all are still coming off the heels of Christmas parties and even getting ready for some New Year's parties. Uh, The best person I know who throws parties is my sister. She is absolutely outstanding at throwing parties, and she's good at coming up with themes. She has costume parties. She'll even have a murder mystery on occasion, which is my my favorite type of party. Um, But there was one party in particular that I remember when I think back over my sister's long list of parties. Uh, And just so clear, I'm saying parties, not potties, which often happens with my British accent. I get made fun of by middle schoolers way too much. But uh, I was at this party, and the theme of this particular party was wannabe gangsters, okay? I don't know why we came up with this as a theme, but it was wannabe gangsters, so you had to try and dress like a ridiculous gangster, not like a real gangster, but just like someone who likes to think they're a gangster. Uh, And so we got ready. I've got a picture here from the party. There we are, that's me, which is really funny to look back on with my fake goatee now having a beard for real. There's everything about this that I'm about to show you is humiliating and shaming to me, so just be kind to me. Uh, But we were getting ready and I had this brainwave right before the party. I thought, you know what the most gangster thing ever is? Is being bald, which is ironic now really, (laughs) but I thought if I would look bald, then maybe I'll be like a, you know, like a real gangster. But I didn't want to shave off all my hair, because I like my hair. I miss my hair. And so I thought, what I'll do is I'll wear a hat, but I will shave my sideburns down so it looks like I'm bald. And then I can have the appearance of looking bald. So I decided to do that. So I got a razor, and I trimmed this one, and then I trimmed this side, and I thought, oh, this one looks a little bit higher. So I trimmed this one some more, And I was like, now this one looks higher. So I trimmed this one, and then I trimmed this one, until there was no sideburns left. And so now I go to the party, and I've got this hat on top, trying to hide the fact that my sideburns are completely gone. And I don't even think anything about this. I just think, cool, I look gangster. I did not look gangster, as you can see by the picture. So we're at the party, I've got the hat on there, and eventually I'm getting a little bit too warm, and so I take off the hat, And what I thought was totally normal, everybody else in the room froze and said, what have you done to your hair? And it looked a little something like this. I unfortunately didn't have a picture to show you tonight of what it looked like, but it was exactly like this guy on the left. And as you can see, that's wrong. That's wrong. (laughs) So they were asking me, my sister was so embarrassed by me. She said, you have got to go shave that off immediately. You need to get a haircut. So I did go and get a haircut the next day, which was the beginning of the end for me, because it never grew back. (laughs) So this was a really poor night. Some questionable choices led to me trying to create this specific image. It didn't work out for me. And right around this time of year, I think a lot of us are thinking about what is the new image gonna be for the next year. Who is it that we are going to sculpt ourselves in the image of? Who are we gonna try and be like? What are we gonna change in our life? Are we gonna try and be better Christians? Are we gonna be try and be better people? What are the things I can change? What are the things I can do? What's the image I can create for myself? And the true joy of the gospel, I think, is that when we do that, we're missing a little bit of what Jesus has already given us. We kind of rush past Christmas, all these brand new things that we've received, and we go on to thinking about, well, what's next? What's the next big thing? It's not unlike Thanksgiving where we all say thanks around a table and then the next day we'll run to downtown Chicago for some Black Friday sales. We all do this. It's a part of all of our life here at Christmas. But the message of the Christian gospel isn't a call to better resolutions and better choices. It's about knowing better the joy that's been given to us in Christ, knowing better the gift that has been given to us in Christ. It's a very famous and often quoted scripture from the book of 2 Corinthians that says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Gets said a lot, but what does that mean? What does it mean that we are a new creation? What is it that God has done for us that makes us a new creation? So for the next two weeks, we're gonna take a little bit of a a look at this passage in 2 Corinthians 5. We're gonna talk about what it means to be new. What is it that God has given us? 
How has God changed us? And what does this mean for our futures? So we're going to jump straight in. And today we're just looking at verses 17 through 19 together. Uh, and we'll finish this up next week as well. But if you will, go to 2 Corinthians 5 with me. And we're going to look at three gifts that we are given by Christ. The gift of newness, the gift of grace, and the gift of ministry. Would you read this with me? It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. The first gift I think we see in this passage is the gift of newness. The gift of newness. Now, I have started to notice in myself as I've got older that the things that I want for Christmas have changed a little bit. When I was much younger, I was like everybody else who was younger, right? We all want the flashy gifts. What's the, where's the iPad, the PlayStation? If you go back far enough, the Game Boy, which was so cool at the time, right? But we all want these exciting, fun things to play with. We want something we can do something with. But then as you get older, and especially after have kids, all of a sudden you find yourself changing, and all of a sudden you're kind of interested in those socks that show up in the stocking every year. Right, and you start getting interested in things like steam cleaners. That if someone had bought me a steam cleaner when I was a kid, I would I would have said, "What is this?" Right, but these things change. And you know, the best way we could sum this up is this little meme I found from Wheel of Fortune. It says, "Hitting the age where you finally understand why people were so happy to win an appliance." Because that's exactly what happens. I wish it wasn't, but that's what happens. The gifts that we get as adults, we care a lot more about things that are really practical than the things that are just fun. And this is a little bit about what it means to have the gift of newness, the gift of newness. Because what Paul tells us here is he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. God's true gift to us at Christmas time that we should hold on to is newness. It's newness. The old is gone and the new has come. Now, I want to frame this letter a little bit for us because sometimes we don't always realize who are these people that Paul is writing to? What's going on in this letter? Sometimes we just kind of imagine he was having some quiet time with God and wrote down some thoughts. But this is a letter written to a specific group of people who lived in Corinth. Corinth was this very multicultural area. There was all kinds of beliefs and ideas. And Paul had already written one letter to the church there. He'd been a part of founding the church in Corinth. And as they became to know Jesus, there was a lot of brokenness, there was a lot of mess, there was a lot of crazy things. And so Paul wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians that we have in our Bible to try and help them navigate some of that. Try and talk through what does it mean that you have Jesus? How is that gonna change the way you relate to one another and care for one another? And then Paul goes on to his journeys and he travels all around. But Paul hears eventually that there are still some things in Corinth that need to be worked out. So he writes a second letter. Now you might imagine that because he's already written one letter to them about Jesus, that this time he's gonna talk about something new. Because he's already told them a lot of things about Jesus, he's already told them about what he's done, so what are they going to move on to now? They don't move on. Paul says the same things. Paul wants to remind them again of who Jesus is and what he's doing for them. And this is the context in which he's saying, you're a new creation. Right? He's not saying anything brand new. He's saying something that's already been said so that they will hear it better. None of us should ever move on from that message of the gospel. None of us should ever move on from what Jesus has done for us, what Jesus has promised to do for us. And you see, the good news that is given, the gospel that's given that Paul wants them to get is that God has come to fix what is most broken in them. Because... The truth is, is that our biggest problem as human beings, our biggest problem is us. It's you and me. We are the biggest problem that this world faces. When Jeremiah the prophet in the Old Testament said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We're all of us born in this world with broken hearts, with hearts that can be tricked, with hearts that long for things that they shouldn't. Paul says it this way in another book in the New Testament in Romans, he says, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, 
who is a type of the one to come. See, the brokenness that began with Adam and Eve, even though we went there, and even though we didn't do exactly what they did, that brokenness spread through all of us. And so now there's a, there's a lot of brokenness in every human heart. You really don't need to look any further than the news now to see the brokenness that exists all around the world in every human heart. But the good news is God's come to do something about that. The beautiful story of Christmas, of the gospel, of everything about Jesus is that he is God come to fix our problem. Not his problem, our problem. God came to take that old heart, that broken heart that Jeremiah talks about that is deceitful above all things and replace it with a new heart. Paul explains a little bit more about this in the letter of the Ephesians. This is what he says in chapter four. That's not the way you learn Christ, assuming you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness. See, Paul tells us in this passage what the old is and what the new is. We've already been told in 2 Corinthians 5, our passage for today, that the new creation comes because the old has passed away and the new has come. So what is the old and what is the new? I think Ephesians tells us. It tells us what God's gift of newness is to us. Put off your old self. And then he unpacks what it means to be new. He starts by talking about desires. Put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So what are old desires and what are new desires? Have you ever wanted something so badly? You have been so certain that this will make your life complete if you just get this one thing. Maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a certain status at your job, maybe it's a family, and you're so fixated on it. But then sometimes when you get the things that you long for, it's not what you imagined it to be. Sometimes the things that we chase in this life, when we finally attain them, we find out that it's not that great, that it doesn't fill up all the hole, it doesn't take away the brokenness within us. And they can be amazing, good things, wonderful things, but it doesn't solve our problem. That's an example of a heart being deceitful above all things. Our hearts convince us, our emotions convince us, our experiences convince us that what we really need is X. If we can have this, if we can have the right job, the right family, the right experiences in life, then all of this stuff within me will be fixed. But unfortunately, it's not true. And imagine it on a spiritual level. The things that we chase to find spiritual satisfaction, the things that we go after that don't satisfy. But God gives us new desires. He changes our heart. He tells us about the things that do satisfy. And he brings, him, brings us to the one who is the one we need most, which is himself. See, you and I were made for God. Everything about us, our emotions, our experiences, the way we think about the world, all of that was created by God, sculpted by God for himself. He wanted you to know him and to experience his love and his power and his grace. And so he gives us a new heart so that we can. He rescues us so we can know that. He creates a life for us that pleases him and that blesses others. What about new minds and old minds? What does that mean? Paul says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Now I have no shortage of stories about the old mind in my life, of the ways my mind has been broken. And if I was to empty the contents of my thoughts from just let's say the last three days onto the screen, I probably wouldn't be able to look most of the people in this room in the eye. Because there is all kinds of brokenness in our minds, the way we think about people, right? Sometimes we think very selfishly, very bitterly. Sometimes we think thoughts that we shouldn't about greed, about lust. There's all manner of ways in which our mind can unravel itself. And for me, the most pointed way I've experienced this in my life is through anxiety and depression. For me, that is a mental struggle. It's a battle that I have to fight. It's a part of my broken mind that needs to be renewed. 
But God loves me so much. He is so faithful to me that he has given me a new mind in Jesus. Now, I want to be clear that when we get a new mind, it doesn't mean that all the things that we experience that are broken goes away in a happy. It doesn't. In fact, a lot of people throughout Christian history, preachers and pastors and people who love God and have studied his word, continue to struggle with anxiety and depression throughout their life. But what the new mind does offer you are some new thoughts to get mixed in there, to bring hope. See, the new mind gives me hope because it reminds me of a God who is with me, that I am not alone, I am not abandoned. He gives me a new mind that is reminded that God's love for me will one day liberate me from all the brokenness within my heart and mind. And what a day that will be. It reminds me that God has power to make a difference in my life, even in my thought life. So it gives us hope. The new mind gives us hope that we don't have to be defined by the brokenness of our minds. And he gives us a new likeness. He says at the end of this passage in Ephesians, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. See, you are created in the image of God, but unfortunately there's a lot of things that can happen to us that kind of mar that picture. Imagine a painting by Van Gogh, Starry Night, and it got ripped right down the middle. It was stained, it was broken. That's kind of what has happened to the image of God within each of us, through our experiences, through things that people have done to us. The image of God within us gets broken down. It gets obscured. But praise God that he decided to send the original painter, Jesus, to come and restore that picture in you and me. That baby in the manger is the one who made you and I who has come to make us new again, to create us in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, to restore this amazing picture within us that tells the world about who our God is. And you know, even if you are the most messed up and broken person in the world, that when you come to know Jesus, he will make you a perfect image of who God is. You know why? It's because despite all of our sin, God has shown us grace. So when someone hears your story, which is so important, no matter what it is, everything that God's done in your life is so important, because when people see it, they will be shown a picture of a God of grace who loves people and cares for people. Sometimes people in this world need to see a God of grace who gets into the mess and rescues people more than they do this other fictional imagination of Jesus, of this ultra holy man who none of us can be like, because we can't. But he was who he was so that we could become like him. So what we really need is grace. We need the gift of grace. We need a gift of grace. Now, not too long ago, I was asked to be a part of my first funeral uh, as a member of staff here at Chapel Street. And the one thing in particular that really made me nervous about this was I had no funeral clothes at all. I didn't have a suit, I didn't have anything I needed. And I thought, I'm probably not gonna do a great talk, so the last thing I wanna do is show up not looking ready, right? Because at least if I look good, maybe they'll be merciful to me when I ruin this family event. So I went out to try and buy a suit. I was looking for a suit, and I had no idea before this how much suit costs. I thought, 30 bucks, I'll get a nice new suit. (laughs) Right, you all laugh because it's stupid, and I didn't know that. But I went and I was looking, and I was getting through the court racks, and everything, like the jacket alone is like 100 bucks, and I'm looking, maybe this is just like the fancy people's jackets. It was all jackets. So I'm looking, and I don't know what to do. I'm thinking, should I sell one of my kids? Maybe I could buy the jacket then. Uh, but right then, I run into our uh, co-director of high school, Miss Gretchen Gilbert, who's over here. And uh, she says, what are you doing? You buying a new suit? And I was like, well... I'm trying to, and, she's, and I, over that course of conversation, I explained to her, yeah, I don't really have the money for a new suit, but I'm doing this funeral, I, I really would like to, to dress appropriately so I could honor the family so I don't stick out. And she kind of walks away for a little bit, and eventually she comes back to me and she says, hey, I wanna get you that suit. And I, at that moment, I knew what grace was because it was not Gretchen's problem. It had nothing to do with her. It wasn't her suit that she needed to get. It wasn't anything like that. She did that out of total grace and love to help someone else. She paid out of her own pocket to help me with my problem. And that is a picture of what Jesus has done for you and me. 
He has paid out of his own pocket to rescue us and redeem us. Goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 5.18, all this is from God. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. See, what this means, this newness that we've been given in Christ, that he has paid for, it means that we can't do anything to earn it. We can't do anything to be deserving of it. It only comes by grace alone. And that means for you and I in our living is that we should, need, we should stop our striving to try and impress God. We should stop these compulsive needs to make resolutions that we think are gonna make us better Christians. Around this time of year, Christians tend to say, well, I'm gonna pray more this next year. I'm gonna find more places to serve. I'm gonna serve twice as much this year. I'm gonna read through my Bible in a year. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. How about what Jesus has already done? You do not need to impress God. You do not need to convince him that you're worth saving. He has already, before you even had an inkling of it, decided to love you and value you and pay the highest price to win you. Romans 3 tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's not one of us that can say that we have got it all together. But Jesus is telling us this is a gift to you. It's my gift to you, my son. Reconciliation. It's all of God. Grace creates our newness and grace sustains our newness. It creates our newness because it was God's idea. It wasn't ours, it was God's. You see, to be made new was all God's idea. He dreamed up the plan, he put the plan together, he executed the plan, and he was the plan. He was the one that was gonna come and reconcile us to himself to bear it all for us. And this is important because if you think that your, your effort and your ideas is what draws God towards you, then very quickly you're gonna find yourself worrying that God doesn't like you very much. Because if it was your idea and all your stuff that got him to come in the first place, as soon as you mess up, well then maybe he goes away. Because if you were the one that brought him in, you are the one that can send him away. But this book tells us a way better message than that. It tells us the message of a God who decided to love us when we were unlovable, who decided to give himself for us even at that very moment when Adam and Eve did what they did. No matter how broken we got, God was dedicated to reconciling us to himself. And reconciling is this very important word in this passage. Reconciling Greek is a word katalasso, which means to be made totally new. Right, reconciled means being changed from one thing into another in this context. That's what newness is. When God reconciles us, when he forgives us and shows us mercy and draws us toward himself, we go from being what we were into something that is brand new, an image bearer of God, a son or a daughter of God. If you are in Christ, then you are sat whether you feel like it or not, in a place of total intimacy with Jesus. You can ask him anything you want. You can talk to him about anything you want. You don't need to hide anything because he has chosen to love you and to be your father, to be the one that cares for you. All this is from God. But grace also sustains our newness. Paul says, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Can I tell you this morning, you can't out God's grace? There's nothing that you can do at all, ever, that would convince him that you're not worth living. No matter what it is. And I need to remind myself of this. I need to remind myself that God doesn't count my trespasses against me, that he has already reconciled me to himself, knowing full well every sin I will ever commit in my life. He's already done it. And when I remember what he's already done, I can be better assured of what he's gonna do in the future about my brokenness. 
If I know what he's already doing, then tomorrow has got way more hope than if I imagined it's all on my shoulders. In Philippians 1.6, Paul tells us that he who began a good work in you will see it through to completion. God has loved you, he started this, and he's gonna finish it for you. The last gift that we see, we've got the gift of newness, the gift of grace, and now we see the gift of ministry. And this is an important one. He says to us in verse 19, and trusting to us the message of reconciliation. Adding on to what he's already said in 18, that Christ has reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Ministry, meaning serving others and getting involved in sharing our lives with us, is a gift from God. It's a gift from God and it's a part of our newness. It's a part of what it means to be a new creation. I was listening to a pastor talk about this passage this week and what he says is if we focus on a message about Jesus that is all about how he saved us but doesn't mention what he's called us to, then it's a half gospel. The gospel becomes a half gospel if we don't consider our mission as much as our salvation. If we go back to Ephesians 4 that we've already talked about where Paul tells us about the new self, we read this in verse 25 through 32. And this is a longer passage, but I want you guys to listen as we go through this and think about what kind of person do you become in Christ. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. The thing that I notice about everything new in this passage, this new self, these new behaviors and new attitudes, is that all of them exist for someone else outside of me. All of them are intended to build others up, show grace to others. He starts saying, speak the truth to your neighbor, be honest with them, be clear with them. Work honestly so that you may have something to share. Work so that you can then bless others. Speak in ways that give grace to those who hear. I'm not good at that one. Be kind to one another. Forgive as Christ forgave. All of this is a list of ways in which we are changed so that we might give grace to others, be kind to others, bless them, serve them, love them. See, all of this that God has done in Christ, what he's given us in his son, is not only a gift of being reconciled to himself, but the gift of now being able to bring reconciliation to others as well. We are completely changed so that we can lead others to change. Gospel isn't just good news for me and you, it's good news for everyone. And if we do not share it, then who will? So who are the people in your life that need Jesus right now? And by that, I don't just mean hearing the story of Jesus, although that is a wonderful start and the heartbeat of what we want. It's about people who need Jesus' grace and mercy that you can go give to them. Serve a family in one of countless ways. I could list off a whole bunch of things that you could do, but I think probably you're a lot more creative than I do because you know the people in your life that need Jesus, that need hope, that need mercy, that need love. And you have been filled with the Spirit of God and the gifts of the Spirit so that you might be a picture of grace to the world around you so that you can be a chapel on your street. You exist for your neighbors. That's why we care about that here at Chapel Street is because we know what God has done for us and we know what God has called us to do for others. 
We want to be a chapel on our street. We want to love our neighbors because that's what it means to follow Christ. To tell others that they are valued and significant in God's eyes, that he's given everything for them and stands ready and willing to bring hope into the darkest places of their lives. There's a numerous bunch of ways you can do that here even in church. You can serve with the student ministry. You can serve with kids ministry. You can serve with masterpiece and give love to kids that desperately need it. Students, you can serve and find ways to serve in your schools. You can be a part of Buddy Break. You can be a part of being a greeter team, who by the way, are the first people that new people will see when they come into this church. So that job absolutely matters and is an amazing way to serve others because you will get to be the first picture of grace that people see. You can dive in in one of a hundred ways, but the point is, find something. Find something that's consistent and that's needed because only you can fill it. Uh, every year, I, even though I'm an American now, I like to look back on the Queen's speech because she does a, a speech for Christmas Day. Um, and this year, the Queen talked a lot about the brokenness that's been going on in England with Brexit and different things like that. And she chose to say something that I think was very biblical. She said, little actions can bring change and hope. That's very biblical because choosing to live on mission is really just a string of small choices and small invisible things that you do to bless your neighbors and love your neighbors. And when we do that together as the body of Christ, it will transform the place in which we live. I totally believe that Chapel Street can be a part of transformation in Batavia, in St. Charles, in Geneva, because that's what happens when we all follow Christ together and serve our neighbors. We're already seeing it happen. We're not even just seeing it happen here, we're seeing it happen overseas with people like Elise West. The change that's coming. My own story began really with small things that were done for me that changed the direction of where I was headed in life. I wanna show you a picture of me when I was 16, 17. Look at all that wonderful hair. But the guy on the left here that's kind of leaning in in the blue shirt is a guy called Toby Toll. Toby is an American and he, when he was in college, felt like God had called him to come and serve youth in England, to come and serve middle schoolers and high schoolers in England. He didn't go with an organization, he just felt this is something that God had called him to and so he set up this whole year-long mission project that he could come be a part of by serving in a low-income estate to help kids down. And over the time, over the course of his time in England, I ran into Toby. And when you run into an American and you're British, you want to know them really well because Americans are interesting. They say lots of weird things. (laughs) So I got talking with him, and at that time I'd been raised in a church, but I didn't have any interest in church. I didn't really wanna be there, I thought it was a snooze fest, I wasn't interested. Um, But this guy talked about Jesus with me. And he talked about Jesus in a way I'd never heard anybody in England talk about Jesus. He was excited about him. When he talked about him, he talked about him as though he was a real person that he was in love with, that he wanted to follow. And that did something inside of me. He didn't preach sermons to me, he didn't, make some kind of massive lesson that would teach me about Jesus. He just decided to love me and be a friend to me and talk with me and answer my questions. He chose to serve my family at a time when we were very broken. And Toby Tull over the course of his year ended up impacting my sister and her husband, ended up impacting my mom and definitely impacting me because I wouldn't be here today trying to follow Jesus if it wasn't for Toby Tull. Small choices to serve others and bless others and befriend others can lead to amazing change. Dear friends, God is making us new. He has given us his son. He's doing it by grace and he's doing it so that we can go and bring this good news of reconciliation to those who need to hear it. I pray that this New Year's as we plan for what's next, we wouldn't move on too quickly from the message that we have celebrated together this December, that God is with us and for us and loves us so much. Would you pray with me as we close? 
Father, I thank you for this message of your son who you sent to love us, to serve us, to rescue us. God, I pray that as we come to the new year and we plan for what's next, that our hearts would be set on you, resting in you, not planning how we can make ourselves better, but planning how we can better know you. Well, we love you so very much. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.